good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for being here uh, in this uh, uh, panel that is uh, themed on the Russian internet and that we have uh, somewhat provocatively titled Actually in Google We Trust for reasons that will be uh, uh, delved into at length by the panelists. Uh, my name is Francesca Muziani. I am um, an associate research professor with uh, the National Center for Scientific Research in France, CNRS. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I co-lead uh, since uh, early 2019 uh, the Center for Internet and Society of CNRS. Uh, and uh, I am a member of a research project funded by the French National Agency for Research called uh, Resistique. Uh, sort of acronym for uh, net resistance, criticism and circumvention of digital borders uh, in Russia. So this is a project that's been going on for a couple of years now uh, and uh, uh, it is about, uh, well, the, the current uh, peculiar state of the, of the Russian internet, which I'd uh, like to, to sum it up real shortly, uh, after uh, a period of uh, relatively um, um, decentralized uh, and uh, well where lots of things were possible on, on the Russian internet is now uh, going on uh, especially since the early t um, uh, 2010 uh, uh, a, a movement of uh, increasing uh, centralization and uh, uh, institutional clampdowns uh, on uh, uh, on the Russian internet uh, and uh, um, so th there is an important set of challenges that has been brought to civil liberties uh, by a set of uh, uh, juridical measures, especially that deeply affect Russian internet infrastructure. Uh, so um, in this project, we seek to uh, investigate uh, the, the variety of forms of online resistance in Russia, especially some that, that, that might be a little bit lesser known. Uh, and in particular, um, the, the techniques for circumventing these online constraints on, uh, on internet infrastructure, in particular those that are related to privacy, security and, uh, and surveillance. So one of the things we found in, this, uh, in the first two years of this project is that some of these practices uh, to circumvent uh, surveillance are a bit counterintuitive and, uh, and surprising. Uh, for example, the choice of communication platforms by some communities uh, of uh, uh, Russian internet activists. So this is, uh, was the core idea that uh, originated this panel and uh, our speakers will, uh, uh, will talk about it uh, more. And uh, what we want to do with this panel is to engage in this deconstructing uh, conversation about, uh, about the Russian internet uh, with a series of relatively short uh, pitches by uh, the four panelists. Uh, and, uh, and then we hope to have uh, plenty of time for, uh, for discussion uh, afterwards. So um, we have a, a mixed panel. Uh, we, um, we have uh, um, not only from a gender <laughs> standpoint, as you can see, uh, but also uh, because uh, we mix uh, s the, the point of view of researchers on the, on the Resistic uh, project uh, with that of uh, practitioners of uh, uh, digital security and digital security training and the uh, protection of online civil liberties in uh, the Russian internet. So uh, let me introduce uh, shortly uh, our four, uh, four speakers. So we will start with uh, uh, Xenia Elmoshina, uh, uh, who is um, a researcher at the Center for Internet and Society. Uh, so she's been closely working with me uh, on uh, uh, several research projects on uh, uh, digital liberties uh, and uh, internet infrastructures. Uh, then uh, Anna Zaitseva will follow, uh, who is uh, an associate professor at the uh, University of Toulouse, uh, Jean Jaurès, so also, also in France, and a member of uh, the Resistic project. Uh, then we'll move on to the, the practitioner uh, side of the panel to speak uh, with uh, Daniel Lipin, uh, who, who is a human rights lawyer, uh, intellectual property specialist, uh, and a, a holistic security trainer. He will speak more about what this uh, holistic uh, uh, label lies under. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll finish uh, with uh, Sergei Boyko, uh, who is the co-founder of the Internet Protection Society based in Novosibirsk in, in, in Russia. Uh, so uh, let us start with uh, uh, Xenia and, uh, and Anna, uh, who will uh, uh, speak about some of, these, uh, of the results of the uh, ongoing uh, field work we've been uh, doing in uh, Resistic. So you have uh, about seven minutes. Thank you, Francesca, for introduction. Um, so, um, I've been studying together with Francesca um, for almost a well, year and a half, a uh, bit more, um, the usage and development of encryption protocols, uh, and especially uh, we were interested in looking at how different risk profiles would adapt strategies to choose this or that tool 
according to the situation. And we started with a quite plain and hypothesis that was a working hypothesis. It helped us, but then we understood that it actually didn't work on the field. So the in the beginning, we thought that users could be classified as high and low risk, high and low tech knowledge. So we would have the combination of high risk, low tech knowledge, or high risk, high tech knowledge, low, and, and so on. So you can imagine different mixes. And then we wanted to have equal amount of interviews of each kind of user, have a table, fill in the table, and here we go. But when I started doing these intervie uh, interviews, uh, I wanted to focus on areas where the war was going or armed conflicts were going, and I chose Ukraine. Um, and I went to Ukraine to interview Ukrainian um, users, journalists who go to the east uh, or to Crimea, which is currently occupied by Russia, and also interview digital security trainers. Um, they all have very different views on which tool to advise, which tool to use, but uh, I do think that for a researcher, digital security trainers are a very interesting group to look at because they have a lot of users, a lot of people going through their hands. They see different profiles and different risks, so they can give their overview on what are the real situations in which these people are. So my first hypothesis would be that those journalists who go to the war zone would use sophisticated combinations of tools like PGP, Jabber, Tor, and VPN over Tor, and uh, whatever browsers they would never use Google Chrome, they would never rely on Gmail or Facebook, and very soon I understood that they would only rely on Gmail and Facebook and WhatsApp. And I met with developers because our project was very interdisciplinary. We had cryptographers, uh, high-profile cryptographers working with us, and those developers had this ideal, what we say in Russian, spheric horse in vacuum, you know, this ideal user uh, that would have all these tools, all these privacy-enhancing technologies, and go to the war zone armed with these uh, nice cryptographic strong uh, tools. And they were really surprised when I brought them the field work and these interviews that were transcribed and the table was, was filled in. And they were surprised to see actually they trusted Google. And um, they asked me why do these people trust Gmail? Why do they all use WhatsApp? Uh, I had several hypotheses. So first I thought they are easy to use, they look nice. And second, I thought maybe uh, trainers recommend them. So indeed, uh, when I interviewed trainers, I found out that there have been a structural situation related to how Ukrainian media were developing uh, after Maidan and the war started, that actually uh, digital security trainer, trainings of the first wave, on beginning of 2014, were conducted by the same galaxy of projects uh, that are uh, connected to uh, frontline defenders or Access Now and other organizations that have quite a homogeneous uh, way of advising certain tools. Uh, this was uh, this brought me to another question. You know, I'm sorry, it's a bit a uh, Russian puppet, a Russian doll. You know, one doll hides another doll, and so on. So a lot of questions bringing new questions. So, so the question was, why do they recommend these tools? Is it really because they're better? And I found out by observing for several years, from 2016 up to now, different events like RightsCon, like an Internet Freedom Festival, and so on. These are peculiar events that I'm, I think you're familiar with. I suppose you have been at least at one of those events. Those who haven't, uh, I can give you a brief overview, but I think that you have heard of them. So you would see representatives of Google there. You would sometimes see them as sponsors on the main page of the event, and Internet Freedom Festival people thanking Google for find, find, uh, funding this event. So a very peculiar situation in which uh, tools are recommended on the basis of networking uh, at these arenas. On the one hand, we can criticize this. On the other hand, how would we fund these events otherwise? It's a very complicated situation, and I'm not taking any position here because I'm a researcher and I try to not take position, even though you can <laughs> see uh, <laughs> my mimic is betraying me in a way. So coming back to those high and risk <laughs> profiles, uh, they have been completely deconstructed by my interviews, and I understood that it's a dangerous distinction, and those who feel their low risk become high risk by communicating with those who go to these zones and so on. And in the end, uh, trainers were saying, we recommend WhatsApp and Gmail and not PGP 
because when you go to Eastern Ukraine and you want to get an interview done, your source would propose you Viber uh, or VK, which is the equivalent of Facebook, or in the best case, Facebook Messenger, and you, won't you don't want to lose your source. You have to use this tool. And Facebook is even used sometimes as a social verification tool. They would accept an interview from someone because they have 28 uh, common friends. And they really rely on Facebook and journalistic practices in every, every day. They would, if you remove this from them, the journalism in Crimea, independent journalism in Crimea would not exist. So this cryptographer community that we worked on together with <laughs> was very, very surprised and had to change their point of view on this user community. And that resulted in an app that I'm working on with now that tries to kind of take the best from those tools that people rely on and apply some a bit better protocols. <laughs> So yeah, that would be my first look at that. And I will finish with just an opening on uh, differences between post-Soviet, because I was speaking about Ukraine and then Russia here, uh, but the post-Soviet countries versus uh, global north or Western Europe, uh, the perception of security versus privacy is very different. And uh, we saw it with Francesca when we looked at the re uh, reception of Snowden's revelations in Russia when we would analyze forums uh, of developers, especially, who would say, okay, there is no surprise. We've been sure for years that the government is spying on us. Uh, and it's very funny for us to look at Americans that are surprised by, re by the fact that there have been surveillance for years. So Russian people have been living in this situation where the government itself has become the enemy. And that's why they think that the tools that are located outside of the jurisdiction of Russian government, in the jurisdiction of the enemy state, because there is the Cold War 2.0, it seems, <laughs> at least the imaginary of this thing is real. So people would choose the platform based on their geopolitical ideas about how these or that platform sharing or not sharing the data with their own government. And the Ukrainians would say, Ukrainian trainers would say our f goal number one is to remove people from Russian platforms. They spent two years to force journalists stop using mail.ru or Yandex or VK because they would rather give the data to Americans, which are friends of Ukraine, I quote an interview, and will never give up Ukrainian users to the Russian government. And here I stop because I don't have any more time, but yeah. Anna, I think you will <laughs> continue. Okay, well, it will be complementary with yeah. uh, Xenia's research, actually. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my presentation is part of a larger research, which I conduct with Olga Bronico, which couldn't be here with us. Uh, but still, uh, it's a collective project. Mm. It's important to mention. And uh, so it's uh, the research on how within the Resistic project on how NGOs, trainers, and civil society activists could produce uh, visions and practices of digital security in the post-Soviet space. Uh, so we conducted in-depth interviews in Moscow, Minsk, P Paris, and Prague in, uh, recently, to, to, uh, and with Russian and Belarusian digital security trainers and advisors, co coordinators of international NGOs speci specialized in the field as frontline defenders and access now, with local, local Russian and, and Belarusian NGOs specialized in digital rights and internet freedom, and uh, finally, with uh, representatives of some NGOs using themselves digital security train trainings as users. Uh, and uh, our um, fieldwork study were, was supplemented uh, by um, uh, the study of some international and local uh, security, digital security manuals and guides. Uh, as uh, safe talk, uh, security self-defense, security in a box, and so on. Um, so, among the important <coughs> aspects of our study is the role of the digital security trainers in fostering specific models and tools of digital security and in adapting uh, to the Russian context a set of universal recommendations elaborated by international digital security NGOs. So first, I will just uh, give some feedbacks about the use of Google, Google services by some NGOs representatives which can be classified following Xenia and Francesca's distinction as relatively high risk but uh, low knowledge uh, users. 
mainstream users. Uh, and then I'll consider some um, digital security trainers arguments about the utility and relative security of Google services, explaining why they largely, largely recommend them and um, describe several pillars of what seems to be a large consensus about Google. Uh, and finally, I'll give some fieldwork uh, evidences allowing us to glimpse a possible break uh, in this ubiquitous consensus. Uh, so first, uh, one, just one example, maybe not two, but one, of uh, uh, use of Google services by some NGOs. Uh, like that of PR manager of Transparency International Moscow uh, told us uh, our staff uses mainly Google for work communication, Gmail, uh, Google Hangouts for meetings, Google Cloud and Google Ads uh, granted for free by, by the company to, to, to Transparency International Moscow. It makes part of our security protocol uh, elaborated during a security training. Uh, well, they didn't reveal the name of uh, the trainers and the organization, but still. It was a real progress, um, as some members of our staff used until the time uh, mail.ru uh, and uh, VK. Uh, for, for some more risky communication, we also use Signal. Um, so, the consensus on the use of Google services among Russian and Belarusian digital security trainers seems, seems to be based on several aspects. First, um, uh, the already quoted this morning, uh, Google Transparency Report. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, Google Transparency re Report, according to which no requests from Belarusian authorities and very few requests from Russian authorities uh, have been satisfied uh, by Google. Uh, uh, just to quote one example, uh, a Belarusian security trainer from uh, Human Constanta points out that the choice of secure email servers is subject to many debates in the milieu as she collaborates as well with, uh, with different social and anarchists, um, anarchist activists. And some, some of them, she says, disregard Google. But we once thought that if we can't trust Google, we can't trust anyone, <laughs> anyone at all, because everything is Google. <laughs> And we decided that our boundaries of paranoia are that we trust Google in principle. Why, uh, uh, well, in some occasion we can use end-to-end -end encryption and so on, but still, in general, we trust Google because if you see statistics, uh, Google Transparency Report, they've never given information on demand, on request from uh, Belarusian authorities. So uh, Google services are viewed as unavoidable and omnipresent basic tools, whether one likes it or not and which can be reasonably trusted. Second argument for Google uh, is um, maybe uh, this trust is reinforced by diverse forms of collaborations uh, between Google and some digital security NGOs on the occasion of different forums already mentioned by, by Xenia. And um, just to give one example, digital security trainers from X Access Now uh, located in Russia, uh, well, the main role is the 24 hours helpline, as you know, maybe, and uh, civil activists can call them, uh, for example, to, uh, to block the hacked Google account, because uh, Access Now has, have a direct, uh, direct connection with the company. More broadly, the trust seems to be fueled by the communication efforts of Google <laughs> company, which wishes to present itself internationally as a defender of free speech and uh, sponsor of human rights organizations. Uh, and uh, to give one Russian example, uh, I can quote a project teplodigital.org, um, which is a uh, par partnership between Russian NGO, tip, NGO Teplitsa and TechSoup. TechSoup.org, uh, maybe you know it also. <laughs> it's an initiative of several major American tech companies, as Adobe, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Cloudflare, and so on, which consists to, of logistical assistance devices granted on the basis uh, of the donation of property, software, and tools. Well, Antiplitza is a local partner which verifies the reputation of each NGO and uh, uh, with its recommendation, NGO can access uh, the GAFA uh, um, free of charge instruments. Uh, 
so um, outside uh, uh, tech savvy and free software anarchist milieus, Google seems to have a consensually good reputation. Uh, and uh, the same thing can be observed, um, well, to put it very briefly, and, um, because uh, the time is short, uh, that some uh, manuals and guides on digital security didn't reveal, uh, our study of these manuals and guides didn't reveal any clear stand against using GAFA services. And uh, on the contrary, two steps Google verification is often mentioned among useful tools of secure communication. Well, and um, so this first study of recommendation by IT security manuals and uh, trainers led us to ask the following questions. Uh, how are norms and standards for secure communications developed at the international level, particularly for civil society activists? Who are the actors involved in the development of these standards? And what influence strategies are big tech companies likely to deploy in this pr process? Well, uh, without yet being able to explain all these bases of consensus, uh, we have, in, in any case, observed very few exceptions to it. Nevertheless, just to finish uh, my presentation, some of the trainers interviewed pointed out um, that while the recommendation regarding the use of Google services applied to the context of post-Soviet countries, this wouldn't necessarily be the case if they were to advise activist circles elsewhere. Just one example, a Belarusian digital security trainer says that uh, he, uh, uh, he wouldn't recommend uh, Google services uh, to, uh, if, if I were an anarchist in the United States and I was preparing a revolution there, I would never have trusted Google. Um, I, I would have used VK instead. <laughs> Uh, VK, so a Russian analog of Facebook, uh, because uh, 80 to 90 percent of special services requests from countries such as the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand are satisfied by Google, and uh, VK maybe wouldn't satisfy them because of the geopolitical situation and the uh, the Cold War uh, too uh, mentioned by Xenia. So to finish. Uh, uh, maybe the consensus about Google as providing secure communication services is transient, situational, and determined by lack of collaboration habits and authorities' competences, as well as by geopolitical power relations and, stake, and uh, the stakes of international rivalries, which are themselves shifting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, do you believe in Google? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I use. Uh, uh, thank you. I use this uh, this word, uh, believe, uh, mm, not trust, uh, because uh, if you if you want live simply, and you and you want uh, safely, uh, you should believe. Just believe. Uh, but uh, we. We're not, we're, not, we're not so simp simple people to to, to believe. Uh, we uh, should uh, to analyze the threats, and uh, we should use all instruments to uh, mm, uh, <clears throat> to make our work. Uh, I, ca I can talk. Uh, from point of view of uh, security trainer in uh, holistic security, uh, it uh, includes uh, it, it about uh, all all uh, aspects. Uh, not only IT security, it's about uh, law security uh, and uh, psychological security and physical security. We protect the journalists uh, who uh, who need to to use all uh, communication services and uh, we can uh, mm, stop using uh, some popular services and uh, I said uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, when, when, uh, when journalists ask about most uh, safely services or messengers I said that if you want, uh, if you need to use the Google, use Google. But you uh, 
not 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 be so simple. Uh, if you if you need to to save your data on uh, Google Drive, just uh, encrypt it. Uh, if you need uh, to messaging for, uh, through the Gmail, uh, encrypt it. And uh, that's all. Uh, what about uh, you talk about Facebook, but you uh, you don't say about uh, the Facebook uh, uh, reports? I know uh, that in Russia, Facebook ignores uh, uh, the government. Uh, government uh, requests uh, and uh, I have uh, my personal um, experience in some law case uh, with, uh, with defamation. I uh, have the, uh, the uh, uh, Kurds Act to send requests in Facebook uh, about uh, the user uh, about uh, his IP addresses and uh, uh, some contacts. Uh, Facebook ignore it. Uh, it's talking about Russia. I believe, <laughs> I know, many people uh, do not trust the, the big companies like Google and Facebook. Uh, it, it's very good, uh, but in Russia, we have some, uh, uh, we have different, uh, different level of problems. I think, uh, in some, maybe sometimes in future we uh, will sit here and talking about the privacy and about um, some rights in the internet, but in Russia we have a really, really uh, hard situation. Uh, about access now, uh, access now uh, don't have uh, any um, any uh, any 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 workers in Russia because it's not safely. Uh, they will uh, they will be uh, evacuated in other countries. So, uh, we have uh, another problems. <coughs> um, sorry, I used my notes. <laughs> uh, uh, for Russia, um, the public request of rights and freedoms is not yet so massive and uh, not sufficiently focused on uh, heads of people. Uh, the reason is not mentality and cultural features, but the consequences of many years of life under uh, hard propaganda over the Soviet period. Uh, the current uh, Governments, authorities are very intensively uh, reviving the old Soviet mechanism of misinformation and manipulation. And uh, I think that disinformation is a big problem of, of today big problem. Um, I value that it's attacked by social engineers. Uh, now it's not only about bank accounts, passwords, of some kind of personal information. Uh, uh, we're talking about the, mm, some trades uh, that was done by uh, single or small groups of uh, uh, digital activists or uh, political activists. Um, the, the government uh, working in, uh, in organized companies, uh, we name it divisions, uh, to carry out political tasks. Uh, they attack rights and freedoms through the manipulation and disinformation prompting users. 
to enter groups, uh, to become an actors in conflict, or vice versa to in, uh, in action where civic activity is needed. My colleagues and I studying the methods of political uh, manipulation. Uh, with the helpline uh, of ACES now, we uh, help to restore access to accounts and uh, learn to how protect groups and communities in the network. In addition, uh, there are various services and applica uh, applications created by pro-government uh, Russian developers or related. Uh, to complete and crowd, uh, I would save the secure services and applications. Uh, we're looking to, um, we're looking for ways to evaluate the uh, identified developers and their products, give uh, users evaluation criteria, uh, and for my opinion, we have a, uh, important steps to increase manipulation resistance. The first. Uh, uh, it's about skills for identifying fake personality, bots, trolls, uh, to recognition skills in a cognitive skills that it, uh, that a person develops, uh, uh, he grows up in offline life. Uh, in online life, uh, we are rebuilding our skills of personality recognitions uh, and uh, some tools may appear to analyze user uh, data in open source to, to identify. Uh, we should study the mechanisms of disinformation in Soviet uh, manuals, like L Lenin or else. Uh, and uh, we should monitoring election companies online uh, monitoring communities, uh, groups, channels in messengers. And I think we return the discussion of uh, usability of uh, electronic government and to protect. I guess that next. we will be able You're to next. come back to some of the points okay. later on. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, I think that this is the, the better one you may have. <laughs> Thanks. So we, with Sergei, we are taking a, a step back from like experiences and okay. research. Uh, I could be here um, in position of advocating uh, Russian user's profile against your uh, objections. Uh, first of all, you could not only treat a uh, Google and Facebook and so on as a messaging services. It, uh, uh, it's firstly for us, it's a media platforms. Uh, some history here. Uh, in, uh, from since um, 2000s, uh, in Russia, all the traditional media, newspapers, TVs, and so on, are state-controlled or state semi-controlled through uh, government companies. So only internet was, since 2000s, only internet was the freedom of speech territory. After Arabian Springs, our government uh, understand that, oh, internet could be still free. Uh, could be still danger to our authority. So they started to oppress the opposition uh, opinions and so on in the internet uh, too. Uh, and in, the, in that case, uh, now as a politician, as an opposition politician, I have only four methods uh, to get in my message to my auditory. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and no at all. It, it's not a matter of threats, it's a matter of my existence as a politician using this platform. And if I still using Facebook and Google YouTube, uh, that's not a problem to use their messaging services. They are, I'm still using these platforms uh, to get my words uh, heard. Uh, it's first. Um, second one, uh, speaking about threats, uh, it's not only uh, speaking about uh, theoretical or some kind of mythical uh, threats. Uh, let's speak about real threats. Uh, for example, I'd, I could use Facebook or I could use VK, uh, for mentioned. And uh, let's see on the 
court statistics in Russia. For VK, we have thousands of users jailed for their opinion in the networks. It could be everything. Uh, for example, I know personally the uh, person uh, who could be who could jailed for uh, posting uh, the picture with the words uh, "the God is dead." So. You, See simple, or you could speak uh, about politics, or you could discuss even in closed group. You could discuss with your friends where to get marijuana. Okay, you go to jail, and uh, thousands of people jailed for posting in VK. And uh, I've uh, specially analyzed only one or two cases about Facebook. So speaking about real threats. Uh, for me, Facebook is relatively safe because all other threats, they are not so uh, dangerous to my mind. This, uh, uh, I am the person who uh, last three years I have been jailed months or two weeks, uh, twice a year. Uh, I have my uh, laptop confiscated and my smartphones confiscated uh, not uh, frequently within three or four months. So uh, in your profile, it should be a high risk user. I uh, don't know about te high technical or low technical, but, but uh, high risk. And still, uh, I could freely use uh, Gmail and Facebook since uh, my government could not get information from them. And uh, messaging in, in Facebook, a messenger, uh, it could be funny, but it's still safe for me. Uh, safe in terms of uh, my state as my main enemy, uh, okay? And uh, speaking about platforms, uh, maybe the main, uh, main, main problem here uh, it's that uh, now uh, relatively social active users, they're understanding the problem and uh, they're at least shifting from uh, VK and state-owned platforms such as mail.ru and yandex.ru and so on because these platforms giving the information according to my speech at the morning they are giving the information about all the users uh, IP addresses and all the user messages in real time so FSB even don't need uh, to do uh, uh, official requests paper requests they could get all the information straightly from this platform and for Facebook and for Google we have uh, other situation they need to do a request they need to do a sentence uh, papers, uh, court papers, and so on. Uh, that's why it's uh, the main difference for us. But the problem here, then our um, government understanding the problem, and they're starting to solve it according to the ways they could do it. Uh, so uh, we could not uh, choose a Chinese way. Uh, because uh, 40 million everyday users, it's a problem for our government. Uh, still being dictatorship, we need to rely on public opinion uh, Anyway, uh, so they could not uh, simply ban YouTube and Facebook from uh, Russian internet. Uh, they need to use other methods. And methods they are using are rather uh, simple and understandable. Uh, they are intimidating their main uh, international uh, internet platforms with high fines, with a uh, danger of being blocked and lose the revenue from Russia and so on. And they are working with them uh, very close to getting the uh, Google uh, removing the wrong videos, uh, wrong in political uh, case, uh, not in YouTube uh, rules. Removing the wrong videos uh, from YouTube, uh, removing the wrong posts from Facebook, uh, wrong uh, it's here in uh, commas, of course. Uh, and uh, getting the information of the users. And uh, sometimes they are successful, sometimes they are unsuccessful. Now it's some kind of uh, fight maybe. Uh, so then uh, government on one side and uh, platforms on other side, but still, uh, the main concern of uh, big platforms, the, uh, their, it, it's their revenues, fines, and uh, not the users. It's, it's, it's a concern for us. Because uh, if Google uh, today or uh, Facebook today starting uh, cooperating with our governments and they are going this way slowly, maybe not so fast as Russian companies because they have not so huge risks, but they are slowly moving uh, towards, uh, towards uh, this, this way. So it's a problem for our users because if uh, today Google became uh, cooperate with our government uh, closely, I'll be jailed not two times a year, maybe five, six times a year, maybe not for a month, but still for five, seven years, and so on. That's the biggest travel. Uh, that's why our main concern today 
is working uh, with international platform, getting them uh, to understand the problem and to understand that all their uh, communication with our government, all the legal compliance, uh, it's, a, it's a problem for, for real users, for the uh, rights of the users and for freedom of speech uh, too. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think that Xenia wanted to follow up with her point. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sergey, a lot. You were mainly looking at me, so I feel like I need to respond. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was here defending the right of Russian people to use Facebook and, and Gmail and not saying that it's bad that they use it. Uh, just maybe you didn't get that message. The message was addressed mostly to the Western high tech cryptographers who would like Russian users to not use Gmail and Facebook, who would imagine high-risk journalists going to the war zone with Jabber, PGP, blah, 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 and all these things, and they feel like they're disgusted by the fact that the Russian users rely on Gmail and, and Facebook, and they don't want to go down from the cloud, from, sorry, from someone else's computer. Uh, I, I hope you understand the joke. They don't want to go from the, their heaven, uh, where they would imagine this perfect high-tech savvy journalist equipped as, uh, you know, with Nokia 3310 and uh, walkie-talkie and whatever. And the, the, I, I'm defending here the Russian uh, journalist who, who has the only way, you know, to, to deliver his or her contact through, through these big platforms. But in the same time, I'm also analyzing as a social um, a researcher, I, I look at the other side, which is, uh, I, didn't, I didn't talk about this, the lifestyle Cho choices, cho choices of platforms of people who, who they are vegan people, you know, and they're also uh, digital vegan, I, I would call them. They don't, they have never tried Facebook, they would never do it. They don't consider it as a tool, as a vegan is not considering a sheep as a, as a food or something. So th these people also exist. When Anna mentioned anarchist circles, uh, I know people from Russia who don't trust Gmail and Facebook and they prefer using a very uh, shady, uh, not shady, very weird inter interface like Rise Up or whatever, uh, which, which is a trustworthy thing, but not usable. So there are, there are also these groups, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are also these groups of people. Uh, and I think we, we, here, we here need to put them on the same uh, surface and look at all, all of them and give them the right to, you know, to express. But it's just to say that I'm, I'm on your, uh, like I'm, I'm with you on, on defending, you know, Russia, Russian, uh, Russian media especially. Uh, because they really rely, it's a very good point that you mentioned, it's not just for communication one-to-one, -one, it's for delivering content to many people. Maybe just would like to add also in response uh, to Sergei's uh, uh, insight about, uh, the, uh, about that, uh, the ongoing maybe, um, uh, ongoing uh, Google and other uh, companies will uh, will be progressively more and more collaborative maybe with Russian government. Uh, and I have some insights, uh, some evidence, uh, evidences from my field work in Belarus. Um, for example, one opposi uh, oppositional journalist, the head of Belar Belarusian Journalistic Association, told me that if Google doesn't review any information about its account holders on request of Belarusian authorities, it's certainly because the latter, the Belarusian authorities, don't try, don't try too hard to ask Google for that. Uh, so there are very few requests from Belarusian authorities because maybe they have, they lack competences for that. They don't have um, the, 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 the legal language, the, the habits, ju judicial habits to, to formulate these requests with some references to the law, uh, to court decisions or if, anything, uh, they are, are more eager with just uh, for enforcing methods with police confiscating the, the computer and so on. And so it's m maybe just uh, <coughs> uh, um, the time to, uh, for Russian also uh, and uh, for Belarusian authorities just to get the competences of this, uh, of the co correct language, judicial, technical, to, to formulate the good requests and that Google maybe uh, and other platforms, GAFA, will more and more uh, um, satisfy them. So which, which is, uh, this is the, the risk of, of this. And, and another um, important thing about Facebook, uh, as you know, uh, the Facebook Messenger is not identified user by the phone number. Uh, for Russia, it's it's uh, it's really uh, really uh, really 
are really important uh, because the uh, phone users should uh, should provide uh, his passports, and if you post um, um, in messages like a Telegram in public uh, in public channels some information uh, from your number, uh, you you do it publicly with your passports, and governments know all about you. Uh, the Facebook Messenger uh, did not this. <laughs> Do not identify. Yes. Uh, and then we'll. The, uh, I have a not so, such good information for you. They are studying and they are studying hard and they are doing things better. Of course, easily easily to get information from Russian service because you even don't need to ask. As I said before, you could get all the information automatic because we have SORM. It's a automatic surveillance system and they are obligatory for all the internet providers, all the social networks, all the information platform. So they could get in real time without asking. That's why for them it's. Yes, it's really hard job to go to Facebook and ask, oh, why do I need all this crap? Uh, uh, but they are studying uh, at the first. And a good story here uh, that most of the threats uh, with that uh, Russian government uh, pressing on the platforms, it's, uh, uh, it's a myth mythical, I think. Because, for example, uh, let's look at the Telegram. Uh, it's uh, best example. Uh, the Telegram, uh, it's... Uh, own it mostly by Pavel Durov, it's a Russian, uh, Russian citizen, uh, who um, uh, stated uh, that directly that he, he is not going to cooperate with the Russian government. Uh, not the position of Google and Facebook, so we are cooperating here or maybe here, or no, here not. And it's, it's a, it was a direct statement. We are not cooperating with Russian secret, uh, Russian secret services. Um, one, one, one thing, uh, the Telegram officially is blocked on all the Russia territory. Officially it's blocked. Still, we have uh, evidences that all the Russian federal authorities still using Telegram. All the users of Telegram still using Telegram. Even head of Russian censorship, internet censorship authority, uh, it's called Roskomnadzor, it's uh, official, uh, officially censorship internet authority, even the head of Roskomnadzor using Telegram and having an account here. So then we say in Russia, you will be banned, it, it's not it at all. Yeah, you could not be, because uh, even our uh, premier mi pr prime minister and so on, they are watching YouTube, how could it be banned if, we are in, if they are watching it? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good position, but that's why, that's why we need to really uh, hard on position of the company, uh, because uh, best of for us, for civil society, is best than Google taking the position of Telegram. No, we are not cooperating. The human rights, the freedom of speech, it's uh, first of us and uh, your, your legal statements and so on. The second, uh, it was it, it could be a best position, but still we couldn't get it now. Thank you. So thanks a lot to, to the four of you for the, your uh, pitches and uh, for this CODA discussion. I would like to open up the, the floor for a wider discussion. Now we have about 20-25 minutes for it. Uh, so shoot. <laughs> the first question is always harder. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Tika Tertuade, I work for a human rights organization here in Brussels, uh, International Partnership for Human Rights, and we work in post-Soviet countries, Russia, Ukraine, especially East Ukraine, Central Asia, and South Caucasus. And we have been over-trained in digital security, and we work with organizations on the ground. And I think uh, all the things you have said is very relevant, but there's the one dimension also to it, uh, which is uh, very often we defer to the local organizations to decide what is safe. Russians, for example, Russian human rights organizations refuse to use PGP, Signal, um, any that's, because it's a red flag. They say if we use these uh, channels, this will draw further attention to our activities from security services, so we prefer to use Google. Uh, there we have others across Central Asia who choose to use uh, Proton or PGP because they feel it's safer. So I think it's, uh, we learned over the years that we have to listen to them what they feel is the safest way of doing it. And the second point I wanted to make was about Crimea. We work in Crimea and I think what happened in Crimea after big arrests of uh, 
uh, journalists and Crimean Tatars, the, the, the big wave of citizen journalism uh, emerged, and we had a couple of them in September in Brussels, and uh, for them, Facebook is a medium. Without, they go to the courtrooms, they film there, when they're arrested, they go, they film, they broadcast, so this is a way of communicating for them. Um, they are aware, actually, many of them are aware of the potential risks, but they, they go with whatever is safe for them and what, however they can get their message out, because it's so isolated in Crimea at the moment that there are no Ukrainian journalists don't have access, international journalists don't have access, so it is kind of for them, this is how we can get our voice out there. So I just want to comment. Okay. Can I just quickly react on Crimea? Uh, I've been researching this for one year when I worked at Citizen Lab, and uh, what you said is exactly what I saw in the fieldwork. Uh, I was focusing on exiled uh, media, because after 2015, uh, the middle of 2015, um, many media organizations left uh, Crimea to move to mainland Ukraine. Um, the period of uh, transition has ended for them, and they decided to leave, but they were sending some of their reporters to the peninsula, Though now I see that many of them ref are refused entrance. One of my friends has just uh, last week got blocked. So it's like crazy how uh, it's now isolated. And indeed, they rely on local informers, informants, who are mostly Crimean Tatar activists. And indeed, it's Facebook that is used there. And not only it's used, but it's used in a very interesting way that includes um, unusual practices for the for, for many people, including myself, some of Crimean Tatar wives uh, of the prisoners would use a lot Facebook to communicate about the family and the personal life. They would sometimes give names of the children or uh, refer to the bigger family, bigger community, because they feel safer, uh, like publicity, security by publicity kind of thing, and their community, because it's quite hermetic, it has its own traditions and so on. When you refer to them publicly, you kind of feel protected because you, you show from where you go, from where you come, who you know, and it's very contrary to how Western people would use, uh, would understand privacy or security. So indeed, uh, it's totally relying on Facebook. The Crimean journalism survives because of that, in a way. Uh, I could say that uh, uh, speaking about uh, Russian uh, profiles and uh, not using the sophisticated cryptography tools because if you are using them you are showing you as a bad guy maybe criminal because why do you need them uh, uh, it's uh, you are definitely true I could give you another example uh, in our constitution they have a paragraph 51 which give me the rights in police interrogations and in court interrogations not to speaking against me and all the time in police then I'm saying I using uh, uh, my right by giving me by constitution by 51 paragraph they saying oh a fair person could not need this if you are a good person you could speak freely all that you think you don't need this and uh, much of our activists in police they're speaking freely against them because they even don't think that they could use this right because uh, good guys don't need this and this, that's a problem too of course uh, about signal you, you you're talking and pgp we uh, actually we recommend to use the signal or pgp tools to sense uh, sense sensitive data but uh, when we fight with the propaganda, we, we must use all, all, all public uh, social networks and all public channels. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> yes, to say, we, we would also, uh, uh, as the, especially the members of the resistive team, we would be very keen on uh, exchanging with uh, other researchers or other practitioners who are faced with uh, well the choice of communication tools by activists in particular situations in other contexts than Russia. So if uh, uh, if anyone in the audience uh, wants to to talk further about this, uh, please uh, eventually do or right now or uh, eventually. Yeah, please. <laughs> I have a specific question for Sergi because before in the talk before you were talking about the double identification with the, the Google was sending your number to um, to the state so uh, did I understand correctly that there was a, a sort of collaboration between Google when you were doing the double identification if you will do the double identification they will send your number to the secret service or 
Okay, uh, of, of course, no. Uh, I'm speaking, uh, sorry for my English, I uh, spoke about uh, two-factor authentication, then you are using SMS as a second factor, because in Russia all your SMS could be easily got by secret service, not even from the log uh, even in the meantime, but in real time. So I have personal experience uh, when I'm hiding from secret, ser secret services, uh, they are asking my mobile operator to transfer to them all the SMSs I could, I, I could get in that time. So I could not get this SMS, but they could. And uh, for all my accounts, they asked for passwords in this SMS and easily uh, get them. Uh, luckily that, uh, I know about such a problem uh, that, uh, and I'm not using the SMS as a second factor. Uh, mostly I'm relying on the Google services. I'm using Google Authenticator. Uh, so I need to have uh, my smartphone in my hand to get my password if I, I lose the password or if I need to use uh, the other device. It's a still problem for me because my smartphone confiscated twice, maybe third a, a year, so I need to do um, uh, huge amount of a job uh, to get uh, to my uh, Facebook account uh, again, uh, to my Instagram account, uh, to my YouTube account. It, it's, it's a problem because I need to scan my passport, send them, making the videos and so on, all that hard day to get in your account back. And still I have a fear that our secret service uh, could do mostly of these <laughs> things because they could use my passport freely, uh, getting it from me and all other so things, then and still they could uh, get the access to my account. Th that, that's a problem. Uh, maybe I need to use Access Now services, uh, maybe frequently, because I need uh, twice or three, three times a year, I need to get my uh, services back after they hijack in my smartphone. But still it's safer than SMS, because it's SMS it's easily to, to lose the control. Uh, about two-factor authentication, it's uh, actual not only for Russia. You know about, uh, for example, uh, iPhone and uh, protecting Apple ID by two-factor to, uh, with using the phone number. Uh, we have uh, some case in uh, Chechnya, uh, the journalist going to Chechnya to, to write the sensitive text <laughs> about uh, uh, about L LGBT repressions and uh, take some pictures of, uh, of uh, government and uh, uh, secret services. They, uh, they take in this phone for uh, one or two hours and, and, uh, and return to journalist uh, the uh, just empty phone. On, uh, uh, th this was restored. And we are uh, long time, uh, we, we, can't, we can't understand how they do that. Uh, we, we don't believe that uh, Apple, uh, Apple uh, provide uh, the, the, uh, the information to, to unlock in the phone for, 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 for one, week, one hour. And, and, and now I, 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 uh, I can explain it. It's so simple. Uh, the iPhone uh, has locked by pin code, not uh, w without the print uh, 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 touch ID. Uh, they just uh, take the SIM card uh, and put in, in uh, another phone <laughs> and uh, choose the mode of restoration through the phone number. Take an SMS. Uh, Enter code and that's that's all. Uh, I could give you some uh, funny story about the accounts and uh, access to them. Uh, last September, then the police came uh, to my flat for the search. Uh, uh, I have a three millimeters steel door, so it uh, gets to them half an hour to get to my uh, flat. In this half an hour, I'm uh, disassembling all SSDs. Uh, from my laptop, from laptop of my wife, from my home computer, from home computer of us, uh, put this with the tape all the SSDs to quadracopter and send the quadracopter to my friend. Uh, you could watch on my YouTube channel, Sergey Boyka, the full video, full 40 minute video. I'm uh, filming it, uh, still doing. Uh, and uh, it was not about the getting some information because all uh, my all my storages are encrypted totally uh, on the file system.
system level. But it was about not to get through all this nightmare to get my operation systems back, my accounts back, and so on. It's easier for me to get SSD back inside. Uh, all the times they're searching, uh, they're getting only storages. Uh, SSDs, hard drives, flash cards, even smart watches because on smart watches you could store some information. So we need only information, that's why it's uh, for us it's main, uh, main target here is protecting the information at all costs. And, and uh, where now your co uh, copter, it returns to you? <laughs> they, um, uh, next day they went to my flat again and confiscated the copter so I could not use this way. <laughs> Yes, please, on the front. <laughs> Hi, I work for the International Federation of Journalists, so what you said was really, really interesting and confirmed lots of things, in, in particular the fact that there is clearly a lack of uh, training on digital uh, safety. Um, uh, I just had one question for the first uh, lady in front of me. You said uh, that you conducted uh, a research and that sources uh, were more comfortable talking to journalists on Facebook and Messenger and like these common, uh, common tools. Um, one of the most important principles in journalism is the protection of journalist sources and this applies in Russia as well as everywhere else and it's a, it's a principle that journalists know very well. So I was wondering if you ever had a conversation with them about about this issue of protecting sources and what was their, re their reaction because obviously, and we know that, uh, talking on Messenger is clearly not uh, a, pr a protection strong enough and it's very important not to, not to do that if in particular if the, the issue is very sensitive. Thank you for a great question. Uh, I will precise that I didn't want this to sound as a generalization or any kind of rule. I rather use this, it as an anecdote, as an extreme practice that I've observed in several cases where journalists I speak about, especially Crimea, would go to document, to talk to either people who are under investigation or uh, relatives of a person who is in jail, of Crimean Tatar community, for example, and they would first meet in physical space that was mostly uh, all the time uh, happening first physical offline kind of connection and then they would agree on a, on a tool to use and very often the source would propose what they already have and uh, the journalist would choose the least insecure from what the source has and very often it would be VK or Facebook Messenger so it would be rather Facebook Messenger or if there is WhatsApp then it would be rather WhatsApp so it's like choosing the most secure from what exists sometimes because I asked, what do you do if, if the source doesn't have anything? Would you try to help install a tool and so on? This happened, but very rarely. And they would not try to convince a person, no, it's install signal, no, you should install signal, and so on, if they feel that they may lose the connection. But it changes, if, especially for some journalists that go there for many, many years. They have a very good connection and trust, so they can have the voice and, like, say, uh, let's all move to Signal. But the, f the very first contacts were somehow hectic and th th that's not like the general rule that they would all, we all use Facebook or some insecure thing. But, but there is this, you know, uh, compromise where, where unfortunately that situation happened where either you talk to me on this XYZ app that is insecure or I don't talk to you. And some of them perceived calling over a normal phone line more secure than using a messenger even, which is something that, you know, people feel that I speak and the voice disappears kind of thing. Yes, uh, I'm, 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 uh, personally I meet the people who do an opposition politics and who are thinking that owning Nokia 3310, uh, it's safer than smartphone because on smartphone then you are writing in WhatsApp, uh, it could be stored and printed and use it against you, but then you are speaking on the phone, it's safer, but it's complete crap because in Russia for phones we have very sophisticated uh, surveillance system so all that you are speaking on the phone if you are speaking uh, not um, a good thing for our government it's uh, written in <laughs> stored and used 
Anyway, you could be sure. And it's a, it's a problem you are speaking about because uh, most of the sources they're using Viber and think that Viber is a good platform, so we could, but uh, the Viber uh, uh, strictly collaborating uh, this, with our government. Uh, they are obeying the special law about uh, putting all the data servers with Russian users on the Russian territory, so they are participating in surveillance system. So all that written in Viber as speak it to phone, as written in any Russian platforms, it's clearly uh, e easy, easy to get, and so you are endangering, of course, uh, your sources. But it's not anonymous, it's not secret. Uh, uh, the sp uh, Writing in the Viber in Russia, it's the same as uh, taking a microphone and sitting here and saying all the things. It's obviously the same, but uh, the problem that sources are not understanding that. But it's two cool stickers on Viber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's stored on servers of Viber, even like if, if in transit you may be protected while you write it, but then they can request that there is no forward future secrecy and so on. I just wanted to react with a short anecdote which happened to me when I was traveling from Kharkiv to Kyiv to do my field work. I was in a train uh, in the same compartment with the Ukrainian military uh, person who was wounded and was going from the east to Kyiv to make an operation because in Kharkiv it was not uh, well enough, the medicine, uh, like the hospital was not uh, able to do the operation that he needed. And he thought that I was uh, Ukrainian which was really a luck for me because uh, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, otherwise I would maybe have been subject to many hard co conversations. But he was sure that I'm Ukrainian. I was traveling with a Spanish colleague and he was so excited that they were foreign foreigner and he started showing his phone with photos of military objects and s uh, on Viber and saying, hey, look, uh, this is where we are located and this is what we do and this is... Na -na -na. And and I asked, do you use Viber? And he, yeah, of course we use, we all use Viber and it's a Ukrainian military. Uh, and we share it with Russian folks because, you know, I'm a Soviet soldier. He was in his 50s. I was in uh, the war uh, in Chechnya and so on. I was fighting together with Russian soldiers. Some of the old dudes on the other side of the front line, we know each other, we talk to each other on Viber. If one guy from our troops is taken prisoner to, by Russians, then we just call, I call on Viber to my, to my dude, to the other Russian uh, elderly uh, military and say, hey, uh, don't you want to talk peacefully? Let's exchange our guys. And, and he was just openly sharing this with me and I was sitting like this. I didn't say I was uh, studying secure communication. <laughs> 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 but I found out that Ukrainian military was also using Viber and they were doing much more things like sharing the selfie with uh, guns on VK and then their uh, troops were located like that and so on. So now, it's, now it's more or less over, thanks to digital security trainings. Journalists don't do that, but soldiers, they don't get the trainings, you know. <laughs> so it's another thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we may have time for one last question, if there is one. A bit out of curiosity and probably anecdotal towards what you were saying, was just wondering: Is there any possibility, from what you say, imagine no, of any independent uh, hosting in Russia? Does it exist even? In independent hosting of uh, services. <laughs> uh, it just got an, an uh, today a question from a friend who is an anarchist uh, editor, publishing uh, person. Uh, where can we host our stuff? Uh, please advise us a hosting. Outside Russia, please. So what you ask is a very good thing because we would imagine that some American uh, anarchist uh, collective would be very happy to have a secure hosting by Russian activists, <laughs> uh, anarchists or whatever, left wing or any kind of human right, you know, thing. Uh, it's, to my knowledge, I don't know this kind of things open to non-tech people. I do know techie uh, folks who self-host their things. There are a lot of Jabber services uh, in uh, Russia, Jab Jabber public servers, for example. Uh, there are many email providers, independent, small, but they're not open uh, so much for civil society, journalists, activists. They're more like for techie guys, for, uh, for themselves, like their own kind of inside thing. Uh, I try to advocate for that. <laughs> there are new spaces opening, there is new hacker space in St. Petersburg just opened, and we try to push them to host some things uh, that are outside of tech only, but it's a very new movement. There is not this 
radical tech collective culture as it exists in Spain or in Italy with Autistici or in France. And it's this, it should be done for international solidarity, you know, <laughs> hosting each other <laughs> across borders. <laughs> Ah, so I if you're talking about uh, web hosting or the domain names uh, by Russian laws, uh, you can uh, you can um, be uh, uh, it's not your property the domain name, it's property of uh, pro-government services, and you uh, you taking to, to to using the domain name uh, by you know, one or two years, and uh, you can. You can <laughs> Uh, the delegation may be cancelled, and uh, that's about hosting. Uh, you could not get safe hosting in Russia, definitely, because uh, according to our laws uh, and our latest laws uh, in Internet, uh, all the hosting companies should report to secret services. All the hosting and, uh, companies and internet providers should have a channel to secret services network. Uh, so on this channel, uh, the secret services could get any information in any moment. Even uh, internet provider don't know uh, which information they get. You need to build this equipment in your uh, equipment. It's a matter of existence. If you are not doing this, you could not get the light you could not get the working right. So you could not find the uh, safe hosting for you. And uh, on, on uh, as a last action, all the time we could get and take you all the servers and disassemble that and show in, uh, watching inside, so it's, it's not safe. So uh, if you are doing activity in Russia, you're in need uh, to take international hosting. Still, uh, other law in Russia, uh, saying that you could not use international hosting uh, for Russian activities. So one law for all hostings to report and one law for all users to use only Russian hostings. So obeying all the Russian laws, you need to report directly to secret services. Thankfully, um, not all ISPs are really installing SORM. Uh, but we will, won't disclose which ones are not doing that, but there is a big number of those who are circumventing this, but I don't think it will last for a long time. There have been times where like, they would also put the revisor in the kind of sandbox, they would circumvent all the possible laws, but it's getting harder and harder. So, yeah, unfortunately. Thank you. So with uh, calls for international hosting solidarity and uh, <laughs> a call for circumvention of strategies, uh, legal strategies, we, we may perhaps conclude uh, this panel. Uh, thanks a lot to Xenia, Anna, Daniel and uh, Sergei. I think we can give them a big round of applause. Thank you.